we're good to go. So here we go. Awesome. Welcome, ev welcome everyone, uh, folks who are here in this virtual room and our friends out in uh, YouTube land. Welcome to our final uh, virtual jazz residency event for the keynotes virtual jazz residency made possible by the Jerome Mirza Foundation. My name is Nikki Malley. I'm the head of Jazz Studies here at Knox College, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here with uh, our last virtual event. Seven amazing artists have spoken to us about such a wide range of issues confronting artists and musicians and students and listeners and um, creative folks in general, and uh, we get a beautiful conclusion to that today with a really um, personal look at how art is made, particularly in response to um, exceptional life events. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation today. Before we get started with our conversation, uh, I want to remind people how you can participate in the discussion. Uh, we do have some of our folks from the jazz program here in the Zoom webinar, but if you're watching us on YouTube on the live stream, you can just uh, enter comments into the chat, comments or questions into the chat, and uh, our referees will throw those over to me in the virtual space, and then I'll throw those to Jeremy, and we will get started. Um, <clears throat> And I think that gets us through kind of the rules of the game. And now uh, you have just met him in uh, much better ways than I can introduce him uh, if you've just finished watching his presentation. But we are thrilled to have Jeremy Cunningham here. He's an incredible drummer, a fantastic composer, band leader, um, an artist in general, as I, I think you have a good sense of at this point after listening to his presentation. Um, he is one of the uh, most in-demand drummers up in Chicago. Uh, everyone who's anyone is playing with him. He, of course, has um, fairly recently released this stunning project, The Weather Up There, um, which is, uh, he's described it a bit in his presentation. I'm sure we'll talk more about it today uh, in response to the loss of his brother, uh, but also a kind of multi-arts production that combines jazz, composition, improvisation, spoken word, and as you know, memory and personal experience in a way that I think is unique. Um, all of which to say that Jeremy himself is a pretty unique voice on the scene. Um, so we are thrilled to uh, wrap up with him today. And I will just say as a teaser, uh, I'll mention more about this at the end, but Jeremy's going to be with us in person in the fall with the, the Weather Up There project to do a live performance. And uh, so if you are intrigued and interested by what you've heard today and what you're about to hear, just know that in a few months, we're gonna be seeing this live on campus, uh, which is also gonna be an incredible pleasure and joy. I think it's an important work that needs to be seen. So uh, Jeremy, welcome. I'm done with the, the lots of Nikki talking part. Thank you so much for joining us today. It really is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's a great opportunity. Um, as I mentioned to you, we will have questions coming in from a few different corners. And I always start off with a couple of my own, um, and I will encourage our students and, and everybody to ask questions. I know that it can be daunting to ask someone um, who you've never met who just explained to you how amazingly creative they are. <laughs> Any question that feels bold, but that's exactly what we're here for. So um, I wanted to, I, I think I'll start with this question. Um, your, your journey through the, the Weather Up There project was clearly important for you as a creative artist, but also as a human being dealing with loss and grief and trauma. Um, and so I wonder, I think all artists struggle with how to know when a piece of work is done, whether it's a painting or a, a composition or an album. Um, but I, I wonder with something this deeply personal, so many people involved, um, and the fact that it clearly was both a creative project, as I said, and also um, something that you were dealing with and going through. It was a process for you. Did you struggle with, or how did you know when the project was done, and how did that feel? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good question. And I think every artist goes through a point when you're, like, about 90% of the way through, you know, like a, a work, especially an album, where you kind of, you start to ask those questions, like, you know, do I have everything that I need? Um, you know, are these, does everything sound good? You know, are, are these arrangements, you know, what, whatever the questions would be about your own work. And I think, you know, most people, you know, myself included, you know, usually go through a bit of like kind of, you know, anxiety or, you know, freaking out about it. And um, for me, 
what I did um, about, I'd say I was about halfway through the project, um, is I um, I went out to LA to record. I knew I wanted to record some more songs because I didn't feel like I got it the first time when I recorded in Chicago. So I recorded for a few days in Chicago, three days in Chicago, and I recorded about half of the songs um, that are on there and some other material. And then I went to LA because Jeff Parker, um, he works with this great bassist and engineer named Paul Bryan. And so I went over to Paul's house, you know, I sent Paul my music and he wanted to work on it. And so I went over there to record some stuff. And after the first session that night, Jeff called me up and he said, you know, how would you feel about me producing your record with Paul? We've always wanted to do this together. Like, how would you feel about that? And I was like, I think that's a great idea because I, I knew that it would take some pressure off of me, you know, and I didn't really understand at this point what a producer was, you know, because I think like you're kind of just making records in the jazz world a lot of times, especially like when you're kind of doing like DIY sort of stuff or like indie sort of stuff, everybody's just taking on all these roles. And so it does, it just seems like, well, this is all the stuff you have to do to make a record. Um, but in, but in the, um, but I think in the, um, in other music worlds, like, you know, producers are so important to completing a project. And so to have those two artists working on this, suddenly there was like, you know, sort of like a perfect democracy of three people. And so I just decided right then that whatever issues came up about the music, like we were gonna talk about it and whatever the majority was is what, even if it was against what I wanted. And I just did that because I knew that I was a little close to the project to be making all the decisions and I wouldn't necessarily be able to see things from their perspective, which is more seasoned, more experienced, you know, and um, they've been through this stuff, you know, just like on such a personal level with their own music, you know? And so when it was getting close, I think, you know, I think that we all kind of sort of realized it was getting close. And like, you know, I think it might have even been Jeff that said it. He's like, man, I think, I think we've got it. You know, I think it's there. And we all worked on it like so hard. But I think at the same time, it was kind of just obvious. And then even though it was obvious, that was when it was like 98% done. Then I freaked out and I was like, no, we need to add the horn part back onto this song. And Jeff was like, no we're not doing it. You know, he was upset a little bit, you know, and rightfully so because he had done so much work and he was like, wait, you can't do this. You know, you cannot do this. You know, you can't go back to this thing. And so I just think um, if you have some people that you trust, even if you're working on a project with, you know, like an indie rock project or whatever it would be, I think what you do is you just have to have some people that will help you at that point to like get something over the edge and finish it, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. That, that seems so important for, for something that you're so close to. I could just imagine, I mean, letting go of the, letting go of the project is also gotta be in some ways, letting go of this, all the things behind the project, um, which would be huge. But then I was also thinking as you were talking that, um, of course, you also have the live performance component of it. So it's not like the album is done and then the project is never, the project is not a closed book, right? It's kind of right. the introduction for the world and then you get to take it out into the world. And um, I guess that my, my follow-up question is actually about that. After finishing the project um, and all of the deep introspective work that you went, that you went through to put the, this work together, finish the album, then you've taken it out and performed it live, um, what was your experience of, of that live performance? I mean, in, in I'm, I'm thinking particularly for somebody who has made a career of live performance. Now you're performing something that is so deeply personal on a level that's maybe not more than anything you've done before, but certainly different. <laughs> um, did you find that, that bringing this piece, this work to live performance was a different kind of performance experience for you because of how like intimate and, and, um, powerful that the material was for your because based on your own experience yeah it was i mean i'll say that it was really hard to perform the music um 
you know, the, you know, the first few times that I did it because when I start to play the music and I start to hear, you know, like the spoken word stuff and the different interviews that I had done in my family, like I would trigger them through a sampler. And so that would be like over the music, you know, um, and I'd start to hear this stuff. And so I'd get drawn back into those conversations and drawn back into that time when I was having those conversations. And then it would also just make me think about the event in general. So I was getting brought back into this space and then trying to play music. And it was like pretty intensely emotional, but I knew that, um, that it was important to connect with that and then to play through it. And so I think on some level, like being able to do it, you know, was like helpful to me in a way, you know, like to sort of just be like, you know, pushing this music out into the world and like sort of like letting people know. And, you know, and to me, I think that like gets back to like honoring my brother and like who he was and like, you know, what I feel about him and what my family felt about him. And, you know, the, I think the difference between like recording it is, you know, the recording and making all of the parts for it took a long time. It was like, you know, over a long period of time, um, you know, many, many months of, uh, you know, like I traveled to, like I did a recording in Chicago um, and then I traveled to LA, I think, um, to record with Paul Bryan, I think a couple of times. Um, and then just all the back and forth between me, Paul and Jeff as we're just like sending each other stuff electronically. So, you know, versus like the live performance, I mean, we just play the record down, you know, from beginning to end. And I think um, that sort of makes an impact because it just tells a story. Um, and so to go through the whole thing as like sort of like a performance piece is, you know, it's just like this one long thing where it's like you have to invest and like play something and focus for however long it ends up being between, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long the solo sections take and stuff like that. Yeah, it just it really struck me as you were talking about this. So I thought about the live component and I thought about placing myself in the context where I had to interact with the kinds of things the, the memories of, of, of loss of somebody that you love while performing. And I, I, I am incredibly respectful and in awe of the fact that you can do that because that's um, that's got to be intense. But that's probably not probably that's part of what makes the project so uh, powerful, right? Is that people know that that experience is is happening, um, and that you're you're in that moment in front of them. Which is you talk about vulnerability. That's another way of kind of being vulnerable and breaking down that that wall, I suppose. Right. Um, so I have a couple questions coming in from some of our students. Um, this one's from Daniel, who is a multi saxophone player in Christian band. He said, uh, "I'm I'm sorry to hear about your brother Jeremy, uh, your brother Jeremy." Um, your story is inspiring. How common is it for jazz musicians to incorporate per, like these kinds of personal stories into their music? And I guess I would add to his question, were, were you inspired by any other artists to kind of synthesize uh, and experience anything like this into their own work? And you mentioned Coltrane's Alabama early on in your conversation. I wonder right. if there are other, other things that kind of connected with you as far as that. Sure. Um... Sorry, this like my blind is like creating this like really interesting light effect. I'm trying it's, to like, it's really cool. It's around. spring. It's sunshine. It's wonderful. It's yeah, actually great. Yeah, try to try to work this out here. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's like I don't know what's going on here. It's weird. It's like trees or something. I don't know. Something's going on. Um, yeah, maybe I should just move somewhere else. Okay, I'll just walk and talk. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, sorry, I know this is not the most professional thing right now. We all um, live in a virtual weird world where this is right. like our life now, right? <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, for me, um, you know, with, uh, um, you know, thinking about, you know, like things that, um, you know, that, you know, sort of inspired, inspired me, um, I, I can't, I can't say that something like inspired me like directly, you know, like before I made this record. Um, but early on, Alabama certainly, you know, had a huge effect on me as a as a human being. And, you know, that feeling of that song, um, where that's coming from, 
especially from Coltrane as a black man, you know, responding to one of the most terrible racist acts in this country's history. It's just, I mean, you can hear, you can just hear it in this, the composition. You can hear it in the scorn. You can hear it in the way that everyone's playing. And I think, you know, a lot of musicians, I think, do sort of um, put things like, you know, different things that are pretty heavy in their lives into their music. Um, you know, um, and I know that, um, you know, I've, I've heard of these things before, but I can't point to anything specifically that um, sort of inspired me as far as like how I was going to do this or what I like the way that I was going to do this. And I think that's why I had to sort of just like invent a process for myself that made sense. You know, um, I will say that, you know, before I started writing music, you know, as part, I didn't really talk about this, but um, in the presentation, but I felt like some of my compositional skills were like a little weak. And so I, I, um, I took like certain songs that I liked. I, I made a playlist like, you know, of like songs I really like and would listen to them a lot. And then I just started figuring them out. And so, um, you know, just sitting at the piano and really trying to figure out what was going on with them and like why things moved the way that they moved. Um, one of those songs is a Tortoise song, which is a band that, uh, Tortoise is a band that Jeff Parker plays in. Um, and he wrote this song called The Clearing Fills, which is on their record called The Catastrophist. And it's like this really nice counterpoint um, with like guitar and like this bass movement and this kind of drum machine. And it's super interesting the way that um, those things kind of work. And I learned some different ways to move chords by analyzing just the counterpoint. So. I, I, it reminds me of a question and, and both just a comment that when you were, you walked us through your compositional process on the song, um, Who Pushes Up? I've got the title of that one right here. Um, I really, really liked the way you explained that and kind of the exploratory process that you used. Um, uh, and I think a lot of times, um, I've certainly run into this with students who play drums, who don't primarily play maybe a harmony or a more harmonically um, rooted instrument, a concern that they um, don't have the skills to compose or that they're weak in composition. And I loved that even in that little kind of short walkthrough that you gave for us, you model the way of kind of exploring and finding a song rather than, you know, I think sometimes we get this sense that there's all these gates that we have to go through with theory and harmony before we can ever write a composition. Um, and that we have to have something in mind about what the harmonic structure is from beginning to end. And I really liked how your explanation showed this exploratory process where you found the song and the harmony and those are happening together because of, of line movement more than mm -hmm. um, kind of, it didn't sound to me like you had 16 harmonies or chords that you knew the song was going to be based on. And maybe you do approach other compositions that way. I don't know. Um, but it did make me wonder if, that example is that an example of how you often approach composition or do you are there songs that you approach in a completely different way that's um than what you modeled for us in the, the presentation on that one sure um with that particular song that was a that was sort of an older idea you know where i knew that i liked this sort of um intervallic relationship and i sort of wanted to you know sort of capitalize on this idea of like this like major seven sharp 11 sound and see how I could like keep that sound like kind of moving around. Um, but other songs, like I just, like I definitely do it in a way that where it's like kind of starts with some chords. And so I'll just, you know, like I have something in my head um, where I'm like, okay, I think I can hear this, you know, chordal movement. So, you know, the song on my record called 1985, like I just heard this, this chord, you know, kind of like chunking away, like just this like C major seven chord, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, and I was like, how can I make this sound, you know, like this way, how can I move it? And so I, I move it like in some similar ways as that song he pushes up, like there's some similar movements. Um, and I do that to like make the song sound like opened up, you know, because there's like ways to kind of, as you know, to like open something up by like going, you know, with specific movements, you know, without just like 
you know, doing something that's sort of a cliche, like going to just the four chord, you know, to open something up. There's other ways to like make something sound open, you know, by kind of getting some different, you know, things in there. Um, but also, you know, I just think, um, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, you hear a line, you know, um, the song on my record, it's called Hike. I was, I mean, that song, um, I was walking, um, I had to, <laughs> I had to drop my car off to get like new tires or something. And uh, it was like, I don't know, like a good, it was a good like two miles from my apartment. And and so I put my daughter Penelope in the stroller. It was a nice day out. After I dropped off the car, like I took a cab home and I had to go back and get it. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to do a cab for whatever reason. So I just put it in the stroller and I walked. And as we were walking, like I got this bass line in my head. And that's the bass line that's on the song. And so I got my phone out and just sung it into the phone. And then as I was walking, I was like, okay, I think I hear sort of this like kind of like Brazilian you know, sort of like percussive thing, but I also kind of hear this like Chad Taylor type, you know, rim click beat. Chad Taylor is a great drummer um, who lived in Chicago for a long time. He plays with a ton of uh, amazing musicians, um, but he's been a huge influence on my playing. Um, and he plays these like cross stick beats that are just like, uh, they're just incredible. So I kind of heard that and then I started hearing like a melody. So this whole time I was walking, I just kept getting out my phone, opening up voice memo and like singing, you know, terribly singing because I'm a terrible singer. But I was, you know, <laughs> I had to preserve it somehow because like, you know, you can be anywhere. And that's sort of one of the most amazing things about these smartphones is like, you can just record yourself right into your phone. So, you know, during that time when I was making the record, I was singing into my phone all the time, you know? There was just like, like a hundred of them, you know, and most of them were bad, by the way. Most of them were really bad ideas. Which, oh. is, a, which is a good thing to remind um, folks about is that uh, even the most brilliant composers don't nail it every single time, right? That's the, that's the process is, is trying, letting yourself try things out and find out what works and what doesn't in some things. Become something else later on, but the original version never sees the light of day, right? Right. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, I mean, it is important, I think, for, you know, all young musicians and, you know, young composers and things like that to, to understand that, like, you know, if you engage yourself in the process of it, you're going to write something that you like, you know, you're going to write something that you perceive to be good, and you're going to write a lot of stuff that you don't like or that you perceive to be bad. But I think, engaging in the process you know as much as you can you know is sort of the important thing is to like keep it moving you know and I think like you know something I think about too that Jeff Parker told me you know um he's like become I mean he's been he's a really you know one of a, my really good friends but he's also a mentor to me and um you know he told me he was just like you know context is everything you know there are no bad ideas there's just bad context you know so you know if your melody is just like a major scale going up, you know, in a certain context, it could be incredible. You know, there's actually a Radiohead song on In Rainbows where it's basically a major scale. Um, what song is that? Oh, I can't think of it. Oh, I can't. It's like this slow thing, like in 6 8. But yeah, it gets to this place where it's just scales moving right up, you know. And it's, it's great. Yeah, the, the thing you want to hear, I, I, I'm not making this about myself, but I do remember sitting at a party in college listening to a Coltrane album, and I'll have to figure out which one it was too, because I can't remember the song right now. And there's this solo break, and, I, and somebody in the room says, oh my God, that was just the most brilliant. That, did you hear that? That break was amazing. And then somebody else said, dude, it was a major scale. And it was. His break was literally a major scale, but it was the perfect thing to do at that moment, to bridge from the the, the head into this the solo. So... Even yeah. a major scale is if there's a reason that it works. <laughs> um, yeah. On on a very music specific note, kind of moving in that direction, and uh, so Sophia, who is um, a vibes player and piano player in our ensembles, asks, um, "Where do you find the balance as a percussionist between holding the band together rhythmically and being able to be expressive as a musician, 
when I play a more drummy part, I often feel so repetitive in what I'm playing, but I don't want to overpower um, overpower the balance with superfluous, sorry, superfluous stuff. I didn't get that. Oh, and Andy just said Limehouse Blues was the break. So apparently oh, Andy, I think Andy may have been at that party and remembers that <laughs> interaction. Um, so yeah, Sophia was asking about uh, uh, the balance between, again, holding holding the band together rhythmically, being that timekeeper, I think, and um, the ability to be expressive. How do you kind of conceive of those two hmm. things or parts? Yeah, I'm like rereading the question right now and trying to think about it. Okay holding the band together rhythmically, okay? And being able to play expressive as a musician. Um, the balance. Um, you know, I think what, I, I think, you know, Sophia, what I would say, you know, is that I think I really, I don't necessarily think that about that balance, you know, about like, you know, those two things, because I think for me, those things are just sort of like intrinsic to being able to play the way that I like to play music um in the way that I've developed playing music so um I think for me it's sort of you know a given that before I do anything expressive um the music is together on a rhythmic level and it's it feels really good so once that's there then kind of free to do whatever you know uh the music seems to call for or whatever I, I think should be happening um so i don't necessarily think about it as like a thing that like sort of vacillates you know back and forth it's just kind of like get that and then once that foundation feels locked which will come you know usually pretty quickly when you're playing with people that you like to play with or that you play with often um and then from there you kind of can can go as far as like playing, um, let's see, like, you know, like a, you know, you're saying like a drummy part or being, you know, you, you're feeling repetitive. Um, I would just say that, um, you know, like, you know, playing like a drum groove or something like simple, you know, where you're trying to play like this thing and it, and it is repetitive. It's like you're playing a specific thing and you're just going to keep playing it. Um, what I try to think about is like, how can I like make each one of those things that I'm playing, like if I'm playing, you know, with this hi-hat part, this bass drum part, the snare drum part, whatever it is, um, how can I really like make each one of those notes and, you know, things that I'm hitting sound as good as I possibly can? And how can I make sure that it's like super connected to everybody that I'm playing with? And like the thing that I've been thinking about lately is like, how can I like keep a forward momentum going in sort of like a rounded way versus like kind of a, um, like a vertical way to think about time. And this is a concept that um, I took a lesson recently with, um, well, I shouldn't say lesson. We, I had like a long uh, conversation that was basically, you know, talking about music with Jemire Williams, who is one of my favorite drummers you know, of all time. And he told me how he like thinks about, you know, making things rounded and like a, like time is like a sphere. Um, and so I've been thinking about that concept and how you can make something sound like it has real, like organic energy to it, you know, without it being like a vertical thing or a linear thing, but it's like more of like a, a living thing, you know, and it's tricky. I'm not exactly sure how to do it yet, um, but I think for me, it's like, if I'm thinking about something being repetitive, then it, for me, I just have to dive deeper into the sound that I'm making because I don't want to be thinking any thought like that when I'm making music, you know, like, I just want to be thinking like about the sound and like how I'm connecting that to the people in the band. If that makes sense. Does that, does that answer your question, Sophia? I'm imagining her nodding her head wherever she is on campus right now. Okay. Um, yes, she said. Okay, that. cool. <laughs> cool. Um, and she's in the jazz. We, the jazz band has a house on campus. It's a really cool old um, two-story house. Um, it's a gorgeous place. And I'm sure it's a beautiful day at the jazz house. So they're probably all in there hanging out watching together right now. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Andy sent the question. You had very unique voices on this album, Jeff, Josh, Ben, etc. Was everything written for their specific voices or did they create their own parts in the process? Right. Um, so the way that I like to, um, you know, put any band together is by putting together um, people that, um, that have like their own unique voice that sort of um, is, you know, like something that they do because of like who they are as a human being and who they are as a musician. Um, and so when I was writing this music, I was imagining um, Josh playing it, Josh Johnson, or I was imagining Jeff Parker playing it. Um, and when I did the recordings in Chicago for the, some of the songs, Matt Eulery was playing bass. And so I was imagining Matt playing bass. Later, that was Paul Bryan, you know, and so then it was like I was kind of thinking about maybe how he would do something. But um, so, yeah, when I write music, I'm definitely thinking about the people that can play that. And so then I'm making a choice of like, how much am I going to put on the page here? You know, how much is it important for me to have a specific thing? Because, you know, I don't play the bass, you know. I don't play the keyboards like Josh does. You know, he's a really good keyboard player. Um, I definitely don't play the saxophone, you know. So it's like I write the melodies and stuff on my piano, but, you know, I will tell Josh, like, you know, like if you want to phrase this differently, then you should do that, you know. I mean, the page just makes it easier to, like, communicate something quickly, but that's not music. Like, music is not on a piece of paper like that. You know, and I'm sure there's people that would disagree with me, but that's how I see it. And I just I'm like, OK, this is just like my idea of what this can be. Let's figure out and like together what it actually is, you know. And when you find people that you really have a connection with like that, you can trust them to carry your ideas forward, you know. And so, you know, like the baseline on hike, I wrote that, you know, but the rest of it, like, you know, it's just like. I don't know, here's the chords, like, you know, play something that sounds good, you know, or for Jeff, you know, it was, you know, just like, you know, I think I hear this sort of thing, you know, what do you think, you know, and then he would try stuff, you know, on one thing, actually, um, there's a song that I co-wrote with Josh, where I had a chord cycle, I sent that to him, that's the song, it's nothing, and there's like this chord cycle, and I just recorded it on, you know, on voice memos on my piano, and like sent Josh the voice memo recording. And then he sent me back himself playing saxophone over top of it, this melody. I was like, that's great. And then we got to the rehearsal and, you know, Matt just made up his part, you know, sort of based on this like rhythmic thing that was happening. And Jeff was like, well, how should I play these chords, you know? And I was like, I'm not really sure. Maybe, you know, and then he came up with this thing where he was like hammering the guitar, like, like, you know, kind of like hitting his hand against the, the guitar as he held the chords out. And it gets this super interesting sound because he like, you know, I don't know what he did. I think he turned the guitar up and like put like sort of like a reverb on it or something. I'm, I can't remember exactly, but he was like hammering it. And it's because this really nice, like overall sound to it, you know, that like goes along with the rhythm. And I think that um, the project is so collaborative in other ways. This actually kind of dovetails in a weird way, maybe, with a question that I was thinking about, um, was that uh, it, the, the project was clearly very personal to your own loss and your process through grief, but it also clearly encompassed the loss and, and, and grief experience of other people because of the way that you incorporated spoken word and... And, and, and other people appear in, in vulnerable and, and powerful ways in this project. Um, were there any complications that you experienced navigating that kind of dynamic that, um, that your project involved and exposed others grief as well? And particularly with the use of spoken word that there are other people's voices present. That's a really, um, I just imagine that might've been a tricky thing. So and without asking you to get personal about everybody's feelings about the project, but um, was that, how, was that a complicated dynamic, um, and what kind of responsibility, that seems like the weight of responsibility would feel even greater because now the project is not just your voice. Uh, it's, it's other people, literally other people's voices. Uh, right. Well, you know, when I, when I talked to each person, I told them, you know, 
sort of what I was planning on doing, you know? Um, and I, you know, and I said, you know, like, you know, I, I, I want to ask you these questions and, you know, and would it be okay if I use some of this stuff, like maybe in the music and everyone agreed, they're like, use whatever you want. You know, the conversations were really, really long, you know, like an hour, an hour and a half, you know? And so to sort of get to a place where there was like material that seemed like it could work, um, I had to like, you know, go through and just like make notes of like the time marking in the recording where it was like, okay, you know, at 10 minutes and 12 seconds, you know, Lauren says this beautiful thing, you know, or, you know, whatever, 20 minutes, you know, 17 seconds, you know, Joe says this thing, you know, that like really sums up this feeling. And so then I had all these things and I had all these pieces and I kind of started chopping them all down into these little segments. And I, I sent that to Jeff and then Jeff was like, okay, can you narrow these down just even a little bit more? And I narrowed them down and my plan, you know, was like, okay, how can, how can I like, you know, use these people, you know, sort of like to tell a story and like have a narrative. And, um, and I knew that I wanted to this to kind of like exist over this, um, this thing I was like calling a drum choir, which was me, myself, Makai McRaven, uh, Michael Avery, and Mike Reed. Um, and we, I just recorded us playing sort of over this uh, saxophone um, corral um, that Josh Johnson and Dustin Lorenzi played. And then they doubled to give it this like four voice texture. And I knew that I was going to need about like, I don't know, eight or nine minutes maybe to play. So, you know, we're literally just in the studio, just kind of like just slowly creeping it up, you know, and like, you know, playing and like getting more intense and like bringing it back down. And I had people giving us like timestamp cues. And so I knew I wanted this, these things to exist over this saxophone corral and this drum part. And Jeff took the, the, the uh, audio material and started to find parallels and things that people said. And he put together the whole piece elegy from all these pieces and the drum stuff. He edited and created that whole piece, you know, with the material that I had. So I had the material, I recorded the material in a certain way, and then he edited it and put it together and, and took out the saxophone corral, which, you know, we we're, you know, talking before a little bit about this, like democracy. I absolutely was opposed to this idea. I was like, no, we have to have that in there. Like that's, you know, that's like the most important thing. This is like kind of like the big emotional point of the song is like really talking about like what actually happened to my brother, you know, like in, you know, real, you know, just like real world terms of like, this is what happened, you know, this story, um, and this is how it affected these people and affected me. And, uh, and he was like, I think it's just, you know, it's just going to make it way too sad. It's already super heavy. He's like, I think it's just drums and the saxophones. And Paul agreed with them. And I sort of just didn't like it, you know, and I finally was like, okay, I guess I can see that. And I kind of went along with it half heartedly. And then right before we were about to like send the mixes to get mastered, I was like, we need to put that back in. Jeff was like, no, <laughs> if you want to play it back in, then you can put it back in. I'm not doing it. And he was really upset, you know, cause like, he was like, this is, you know, this, we're, this is, we're done with this project. Like we finished it. Like we should be, you know, we should be celebrating, you know, like, and he was like, Nope, we're not doing that. And I, and I finally like just had to trust, you know, um, that these guys were okay. And so I think, you know, as far as like, I mean, I know I kind of went in some different directions there, but as far as like, you know, just like other people's voices and, and those sorts of things. Like there was definitely like at the very beginning, you know, and it was completely understood that everyone was okay with using this material because everyone wanted to be a part of this music because everyone also wanted to tell this story. Everyone wanted this to be a known thing because, you know, this stuff shouldn't happen, right? Like these sorts of things shouldn't happen to people. And I think regardless of one's views on, you know, gun ownership and, and those sorts of things, it's like, 
do we really need to have these guns that anyone could use with zero experience to kill people very easily, you know, and to be able to get these guns with almost zero, you know, barriers in many parts of our country, right? So you can't do that when you get a driver's license, you know, you have to like pass a test, you have to pass sight test, you have to drive the car, show that you know how to use the car. It's all these things that go into it, you know? And for me, it's just like, I don't want to see those assault weapons anymore. I want to make it a little bit harder for people to get guns, but just maybe just as hard as like a driver's license. You know, I'm not saying let's take away all the guns, but, you know, so I think everyone was on board with this idea, you know, of like, let's tell this story in the hopes that like people can think about some of these issues and, and why these things are continuing to happen, you know, to people in our country. Well, and, and that dovetails with the question that I had, which you kind of covered, but um, where I actually, oh yeah, I wrote it out because I wanted to have, get it get it right. Um, because the project is, is so clearly about your brother's life, and then your and, and other people's experience of loss and grief, but it's also about gun violence. I mean, there's a lot in here, and of course, your story and everybody else's story is part of that gun violence story, and it it it's part of how you're you're framing that part of it, but that does make it a political project as well as a personal one. And and some people would argue that all mm -hmm. art and all music is political. I probably actually mm -hmm. would, but but this is very overtly, in some ways, overtly political. Um, although it's woven in, it's I I, I don't think it's, it's heavy handed. You don't come out of the gate saying I have a message and we're going to talk about this. You 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 let the story make um, the argument. But I wonder. Um, what you think this project contributes, this is a heavy question, so maybe it's this big one, but I have a follow-up part that's maybe a little bit here. But what do you think the project contributes to the ongoing national conversation about gun violence? And do you think it's risky for an artist to do a project that is is overtly political? I mean, this is a, a, something that artists have struggled with forever, so it's not it's not new to anybody, but it's new when it's your project, right? And have you found, there are three questions here, I guess, but have you found that the political nature of this has limited your um, ability to present it? Um, how has that affected the live presentation component of this? Because I can imagine some institutions don't want to touch something that has a political angle to it. I don't know if that's something you've run into. So you could take any one of those questions. <laughs> I threw a bunch yeah, in sure. there, I guess. Um, I think, you know, I personally think that, you know, I have a responsibility to speak out against things that I perceive to be um, unjust or unfair or things that I think are sort of, you know, big issues in the world um, that I have, you know, big feelings about, you know, and big views about. So for me, this issue is certainly the most important one to me. There's other ones, um, but this is the most important issue to me because of the, you know, what it's, the damage that it's done to my life and to so many people that I love that are close to me. Um, and so for me, it's like, well, I wanted to honor my brother and I wanted to tell this story. Um, other people sort of said it, you know, like with the words that they chose, you know, about what this made them feel. And so for me, it's kind of like, well, if you think about the things that the people said, the different speakers said in, in the tune elegy, or if you think about my poem, then you're just like, okay, he lost his brother to gun violence. You know, like how often does this happen to people in our country, right? Why does this keep happening, you know? And I think for me, it's like, I want people to make an emotional connection to it because in the news cycle, you know, I remember some of the first mass shootings that happened. And it was just like, oh my God, like, I can't believe that. Like. You know, I remember watching, you know, um, you know, what was that film? It was Bowling for Columbine, I think. Um, and I was just like, I can't, you know, like just processing this idea of this happening, you know, um, in a school, it was so shocking. But now in the year 2021, you know, it's like, we see it all the time, right? And it's terrible still. Is it as shocking? No, because it's happened so many times 
that we're starting to get sort of numb to this idea, even though these terrible things keep happening, you know, and at least for me, I'm not shocked anymore. It's just, it just gets me like re-fired up and I'm like, you know, and the same thing happens. People talk about it in our institutions, in our government, nothing changes, you know, nothing changes. Um, and so I'm like, well, that was one of the things I thought about when I was making this record is it's like, well, maybe if I can get people to feel something and maybe some people that are on the fence, you know, about, you know, common sense gun reform laws and those, those sorts of things, you know, that I'm talking about, which is like background checks, waiting periods, registering your gun every year, you know, like these sorts of things, like having a database, you know, to like, protect us from like people that actually want to do bad things, getting the guns, you know, these sorts of things. Like I'm hoping that if somebody like that was on the fence, heard my music, it made an emotional connection that maybe they would think like, yeah, I'd vote, I'd vote for that. You know, I, I think that makes sense to me. So for me, you know, I am, I'm all for making a political stance with your art you know, if there's an institution out there that doesn't want to have my music in it because they think that like they're, you know, they're whatever, it's going to put them in some sort of like hot water with their beneficiaries or whatever, then they just need to get with the times and realize that like people are dying for no reason other than like the fact that we have a gun problem, you know, what do you want to call it? You know, an epidemic in this country. I mean, how do we not? Those statistics don't lie. Our country versus every other country. You know, I'm afraid sometimes when I send my kids to school, I'm like, is this going to be the school that somebody goes into? You know, I don't know. It freaks me out. And I totally understand why people homeschool their kids because there's, there's a real fear of this now because it happens so frequently, you know? And it's all because of what? The Second Amendment, which is which is what? Like that's when okay. The Second Amendment, what kind of guns did people have then? What kind of guns do we have now? That's the most clear-cut argument for me. It's like, okay, I'm gonna go commit this terrible crime with my musket. So I'm gonna load the musket, fire it one time. People are upset, they're screaming, maybe running, whatever it would be, after the musket gets fired. But now I'm going to load the musket again, put the powder in. That's not the same weapon as an AK-47 or an AR-15. It's completely, I mean, this is so different. This is not infringing upon anybody's rights to not have the assault weapons. Like, I'm sorry. You know, if you're a hunter, you're a hunter. Go for it. You want to go shoot, you know, clay, you know, targets for sport. If that's your idea of fun, fine. It's free country, you know, but like, an assault weapon? No, I just can't get behind it. So for me, it's just like, if you don't want to have me at your university because I have this feeling, that's fine. But I would ask that person to also have an open mind, perhaps think about, you know, my story and the story of so many others. And if their personal liberty and freedom outweighs all of this destruction and loss of life. Well, and I think any institution that, that wouldn't want to, to present your project um, is missing an, an important opportunity for a conversation. Because I, it seems to me that, that, that your project also invites conversation. It, it doesn't provide easy answers. It doesn't um, send people out with, you know, three talking points. It, it asks, as you said, it asks the, the audience to engage in a personal level and imagine their position based on the lived experience and and uh, and and, it, and it's an it's a conversation that we have to have because as you said it's not it's not changing and it's not going away so um that's i have to say and actually it's probably i know we're kind of close to time and this is it's, it's a kind of a dark place but it's also kind of a good place because i will say this is one of the reasons you know way before the pandemic hit when um, andy and i were talking about this project and bringing it to campus that we felt that it was really important to have this on campus um because as a liberal arts institution we are supposed to be talking about big questions and, and, and problems and the the way that you use your creative practice to engage with something that you know 
people are engaging with on the political spectrum and other ways using using your particular talents and creativity and and personal loss which is a huge gift to your audiences that you've been willing to share that um is something that i think uh, will be a really powerful and profound experience for all of us when we get to see it and and um as i mentioned earlier in the very beginning that, that we're going to have you in the fall to do this this program and uh not to give too much of you know, kind of the inside baseball stuff but we've been talking since since last year about how this is going to work because everything was yeah. shut down and and we as some people know we had um seriously visited the idea of having you here um this month to do the project right. but things still weren't open enough and and you and andy and, and andy and i we all had conversations about should we wait till the fall to bring this project and we decided to and i'm your comments now i think amplify why we really wanted to wait so that we can have as many people see this project live as possible um because i think it's important both as a creative project stands alone that way but also um, for the conversations that need to happen so uh, i'm extremely excited to have you um, on campus in the fall and uh and to have your incredible band i mean you really there, there's nobody in that in that band that's bringing you down right the, the the artistry in that group is just incredible and i think um seeing that those interactions live and i will um andy threw a question in that that i'm interested in in, in asking because we're going to see you here in the fall live uh, doing this, perform this program and it maybe takes us a little bit away from some of the <laughs> the really the the tough conversation at the end so when you're performing this this program particularly live how much freedom do you, you allow yourself and the band considering um it, it is it still is it, it's, it's still improvisational music but uh, i guess i'm not getting this well but he asked how close do you stage the original concept or form in a project like this that was conceived as a total work so how far do you stray from the album project like the, the composition project in these live performances what can we expect i guess is, is another sure. way of asking that. yeah so you know we we play the album down, you know, from beginning to end, because I thought that the way that it was programmed, um, which Jeff actually put that together as well. I tried to put it together, didn't really work the way that I was kind of hearing it. And then he sequenced it, you know, which makes sense because, you know, he's, he's also a really fantastic DJ, you know, so he's used to like selecting and like putting together great sets, you know, of, of music, you know, so you know, he came up with this great order. We, we all loved it. Um, it made a lot of sense. And it was just like, well, if we're going to play this, let's just play it. Let's just play it straight down, you know? And so um, I would say that, you know, each song, you know, is maybe about close to what it is on the record only because it's like, you know, this song is going to have a guitar solo you know, the song is going to have a saxophone solo, whatever. We might open things up a little bit more, you know. Um, the one song that usually gets like kind of blown open completely is this song called The Breaks, which is really just like a riff that I came up with that we just like recorded. And then Paul kind of messed with it, put like tape delay on it, and then just like looped a section of the drums and like the melody being played. But live, what we do is we play that as like a theme and then it just like opens up. So when I played it at um, the Winter Jazz Festival, um, I had my friend Mike King, who's an incredible piano player, um, play with us. And he took like an incredible solo that was like really kind of just like over, you know, just like really pushed, like and kind of blew the whole thing open. And like we just like went for it, you know. And so I think, you know, if if something is happening, we're going to go for it, you know, but we all have in mind that there's an arc and there's a place, you know, some, you know, like some stuff is kind of like traditional, like play a melody, play a solo, play a melody again, you know, other stuff is sort of like, this is open. There's not really time for a while, but let's like create this arc, you know, through this section. So some of the stuff where we're just like playing underneath, a, you know, like a, like there's some stuff that my dad says of when he found out my brother, you know, had died, like there's this, you know, like there's this all this rumbling and we're all just kind of like rumbling and improvising with a, a texture, like a dense texture. And then after that, it's kind of like, you know, I might say to somebody like, okay, as soon as the quote's over, just like, just start, just like, you know, 
just wailing or like, you know, whatever, just like be, be aggressive, you know, and giving people like these sorts of cues or, you know, sort of like, you know, just a couple of words to describe maybe, you know, like what I want to happen without telling them like, you know, solo for about two or three minutes and then wrap it up. You know, it's like, no, just like, just be aggressive, you know, and see what, let's see what, see what happens. You know, let's like mimic like the feeling of this, you know? And so I think some of it is pretty similar, but you know, there's going to be areas that, you know, sort of expand upon some, you know, some space. Um, but, you know, I, I think ultimately it's like, we try to keep it to like, you know, like a good span of time, you know? So it's like, you know, cause you know, I also realize it's really heavy. So I don't, I'm not trying to like play for like, you know, 90 minutes or something, you know, with this material, like I just want to come out and like make a statement and then, you know, so we'll see. I've never, you know, the, the funny thing too, is like a, a situation like this where it's like a, you know, a concert setting um, and there's a piece, it's like, if people want more music after that, I haven't considered that necessarily. Right, yeah. I don't know, maybe you'll have to come out and we'll like play a duet or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would also be daunting though. How do you, how do you do an encore to something that is that kind of much uh, holistic and, and deeply personal, powerful? Yeah, I don't know. Nobody wants to hear a vibraphone and drum duet at the end. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, there's this great song though that my dad really, really loved. Um, what are you doing for the rest of your life? You know, the song. I do know that song. Yeah, so there's this record that um, that he really loved, this Milt Jackson record, um, Sunflower. And they play that song. It's super, I mean, it's super lush, you know, but it's, it's such a beautiful tune and the band sounds incredible. You know, the recording is great too. I, yeah, I love that record. Super good. That's what everybody should go listen to tonight, by the way. That's your, that's your like... Um, prescription for the evening and now, now I'm thinking about that song too okay well we can talk about that more we have until the fall right um, I guess we are at that time I am just so grateful I mean what a wide-ranging and wonderful conversation um, I appreciate you sharing with us even more about a project that is already so deeply personal and shares so much in and of itself and I think it gives us and and our audience going into the fall for presentation of, of the show um, so much context to really walk into that presentation and and, and I think get as much out of it as possible so um, I want to thank you Jeremy and I'm thanking you for all the people out in the virtual spaces who are also watching and interacting today um, for joining us and um, for sharing this project with us both now and in the fall and uh, it's it's odd to think that we are at the end of this seven part series um, but uh, I want to thank everybody who has joined us for one or all of these events. Um, I have to thank, of course, the Jerome Mirza Foundation that has made it possible for us to do this uh, and that they will be helping us do this again in the fall. We have Allison Miller here for our in-person uh, residency again. Wow. Uh, when we go back to back to normal, right? I shouldn't jinx it, but I think that's the plan. I know that that's the plan. Um, yeah, we love Allison and we're excited to have her here in the fall. She's incredible. Um, right. And I also want to thank uh, Knox College, the Knox College Communications Department, which has helped us look professional in doing this for the last few months, uh, the uh, President Amont and Provost Schneider, who have been great supporters of this program, and of course, you, you cannot go to a jazz year presentation and not hear me talk about how amazing Andy Crawford is. He uh, has, he works magic, he has done five million things for every one that you've seen me do on, in front of the camera to make this happen. Um, so thank you, Andy. Uh, he has a well-deserved break, I think, coming up after this long series. I hope that uh, he takes a little moment to breathe. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And once again, um, Jeremy, thank you so much. Um, this is a pleasure. And I really look forward to the fall when we get to see you, not on screen, but on stage. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. You too.